for us, this is a completely new experience. Uh, normally, you're in front of a crowd. You can actually see them talking. Um, you can see them looking down at their cell phones. Um, you can see them getting bored. Unfortunately, in this case, got no idea of, of, of what the crowd is and, and how they're going to respond to this. But um, I think the whole idea was to communicate with clients at this particularly difficult time. I, I think also the message that I want to put across is that we think about, uh, you know, the, the whole point that, that I want to come across in this meeting is, is where we are positioning ourselves in financial markets to take advantage of where we are. When I say take advantage, um, it, it's really looking ahead to see when we come out of this, where we are going to be. You know, yesterday I spoke to a friend and uh, when I invited him onto the seminar, he said to me, well, what can you really tell me? I, I suppose he's right, you know, what can I really say? But I've been on the market for close to 50 years and this is the 11th plunge or crisis that I've been through, year 11. Eight of them have been serious, three not so serious. Each has a different characteristic. Some, like the internet bubble, were easy to forecast. Others, like 9-11, were not. Uh, some take a lot of time to put behind us. Others, uh, others like the 1987 crash, were, were pretty swift. And each time, it's, it's pretty difficult. I remember sitting through the 1976 Soweto uh, uprising. There were days in which we never did a deal. You know, we sat there in complete misery in 1987 when the market crashed in October 1987, uh, clients unashamedly uh, reneged on deals and just walked away from transactions that we had entered into on their behalf. I think what distinguishes this uh, crisis from others is this is a health crisis. Um, and it's an economic slump that has actually been orchestrated uh, by governments. We're, we're closing down commerce. We've closed down the economy. Uh, we're limiting social interaction, we're banning travel, we're banning leisure. Um, so we banned all kinds of um, business activity. So we can't talk about this crisis in the same way that we have in the past. We can't use traditional or conventional uh, descriptions to describe this one. A bear market is usually a market which follows a period of excessive spending, uh, high inflation, and so on, where governments introduce or, or raise interest rates in order to cool down an economy. That causes profits to drop, and so we start to get uh, an economic slowdown. That's a tradition, and, and of course, share prices falling. That's a traditional bear market. And likewise, it leads to maybe a recession as governments cool down um, economies. This is not that kind of situation. So my best suggestion is ignore the stats. They're pointless. You know, what's the use of telling me that, uh, and this is the first quarter, this is the worst quarter we've had since ABC, whenever it is. And uh, this is what profits are going to be like. You know, these are going to be the worst profits we've seen this. It doesn't make any difference. We're not going to get anything from those statistics. So it's best that we ignore them. What is happening is that people are so bored so bored sitting in their offices that they decide to use stats and hopefully um, you know, transmit them to everybody in the hope that they're going to mean they are meaningless. I think the one thing is that in all these crises, emotions are the same. We are fed a constant diet of bad news and we only see despair, we only see misery, we never believe it's going to end, uh, and we never believe that our lives are going to be. You know, our lives are going to actually uh, return to normal. Uh, we wallow in misery hour after hour, day after day, week after week. Um, and, and, but the one thing is, this will end. Um, what, what, what's different about this is that we're in lockdown. And even in a war, you could visit your neighbor, you could go to the pub, you could have a drink, and you could share your misery with someone. Here we have no diversions. We've got no soccer games, no rugby, no theater, no uh, Hollywood red carpet. So we can't do anything. We can't even visit our grandchildren. That makes it particularly different. I remember in the 1987 crash, uh, there was a song that came out by Bobby McFerrin. You know, what, what's it called? Um, I can't remember it. 
there's no use, no worry or something like that. And I remember singing that with a couple of chaps on the floor of the stock exchange. We went to a restaurant in Bromfontein, an Italian restaurant, singing, uh, you know, singing songs, but you were able to share it. Here we can't. And um, what it also means without these diversions that the media have got nothing else to focus on other than those stories that are connected with, um, with COVID-19. Uh, and then we have social media and we fed minute after minute, our friends, our neighbors, our family send us uh, more and more stories around, uh, around this particular, you know, about the steam. I'm not dismissing it for not one second am I dismissing it. Of course, it's pretty serious, but um, I, I think but this process of, uh, you know, this, this, this process of news that is flowing is, is bound to leave us um, in, in, you know, constant misery. This crisis, as I said, will pass. So will this uh, tragedy. We don't know when, but we know it will. And what's interesting about financial markets is that they're forward looking. So the shock value of the virus has already been discounted. It doesn't shock us anymore. And it's unlikely to bring markets down much further than we are at the moment. Um, that doesn't mean that the markets are going to turn around uh, at the moment. Um, we're not going to see a sharp turnaround now. That will only be evident when the infection rates begin declining. When we start to see peak points reached, then we know that, that uh, we will see, um, we'll start to see attitudes changing and sentiments changing. Um, also, when we start to see cities coping with an increase in infection rates, Oh, adequately with the uh, number of cases that are increasing, so too will we see sentiment beginning to increase. Already in Italy, things are steady, you know, things are beginning to steady. That steady is different. We don't want steady, we want declining. We want, want it to decline. In New York, it's probably going to take about another two weeks before we start to see things um, uh, um, leveling off there as well. So. Brace yourself, it's going to be a rough period for the next two weeks, and we don't know where markets will go. My own belief is that it's not going to go, they're not going to go down too far from where we are. Um, and when we get to that point, when we get to the point that infection rates have been, are stabilizing, that's when we can start talking about a turnaround, uh, a rebound in the global economy. And then we'll start to understand or try and assess whether the packages that have been injected into the economy are enough. Enough for what? What does enough mean? Well, enough means to provide enough liquidity in the markets. In other words, enough fuel in the markets to keep businesses and plants going. In other words, enough to provide confidence uh, for businesses to resume their spending, to look to the future, and likewise with consumers. For consumers, to go out and resume spending and feel happy about what lies ahead. So governments are trying their utmost to get into that kind of position. And we have to congratulate um, the, the US government, you know, who set the pace. They did not want to, they, they were a bit slow in 08, 09. They did not want to be in that position again. So they pulled out all the stops to ensure that businesses do not fail and that jobs, um, People who've lost jobs can get those jobs back. Um, I think I think the challenge is to get markets back to or sorry economies back to where they were before this this happened. Banks have an absolute crucial part in ensuring this. In other words, they are the channels through which the money flows, and it's up to them to ensure that businesses are well provided for um, when. When, you know, when things start to get back to normal and when we get back onto the streets and going back to uh, our, our offices and work, it's difficult at this time. And I think, but it's also absolutely necessary to ensure that people have money. I'm highly critical of those businesses that can actually afford to pay rent that are withholding it. Those richer businesses, those bigger businesses that actually have the money in the bank or at least have the facilities to, uh, to raise debt, who can phone bank managers and ensure that the money is there, 
to continue to pay rent, to continue to play employees. Don't use this um, as, a, as, as an excuse. So um, I think that's what we have to wait for. That's where, you know, that's still a big unknown for all of us. Um, but I also think that individuals have a part to play where we do have the money, those people who do have the money to ensure that they pay their staff or even in this, while we're stuck at homes, even if you do go out, make sure that those, if you do see a bigger, give the bigger some money, or if you do get your car wash, make sure that you pay those people double. We've all got to ensure that we're doing something to keep the money flowing. Um, I, want, I, I just want to move on a, li a little bit to, um, to the crisis. Um, I think with each crisis, we always look back uh, with regret and introspection. We raise conversations about we could have done to prevent it. And um, in each crisis, it doesn't take long before governments and regulatory bodies um, legislate and put measures in place to prevent a repetition of the, the menace that threatened our lives, our, both our physical, financial lives, and also our mental well-being. And, and I think that's what we want as a firm, where we are looking to position ourselves for forward. You know, forward, if you, if, if you listen, if you think about 9-11, what happened after 9-11? Um, governments introduced very, very stringent safety checks that remain in force. We don't even think about it today. We take our shoes off, we take our belts off, um, we carry our cosmetics in a small plastic bag. Um, we go through quite, you know, quite happy that we're going through these tests. People frisk us down and so on. That all came after 9-11. Also, government introduced incredibly strict um, anti-money laundering regulations, which are in place. FICA came in after 9-11. Know your client. Know who you're dealing with as well. After the 2008-2009 crisis, uh, we had the dot Frank rule in, in the United States, which uh, tamed all those investment banks from issuing some of the dodgy uh, toxic uh, or, or you know, to toxic products that, that actually uh, brought the world banking system down. Um, we are addressing that. We're also, they're not allowed to use their balance sheets to, to over-speculate as well. And I think from this, we're going to see far-reaching um, far-reaching changes to society um, that will come from this. Um, I think the one thing that has come through and is so clear from this is that this rapid spread of the disease has exposed alarming weaknesses in public health services. And I think it's an embarrassment to governments. I know that uh, America's blaming China and so on. It doesn't matter. In a world where everybody is traveling you can't be in a position where you can isolate yourselves from this. What you do have to ensure is that you are in a position to cope with it when it does emerge. And I think that's what we see now, that America or other countries, I'm not singling out America, but other countries have been exposed, that they do not have enough hospital beds, that they do not have enough equipment, that they do not have enough personnel to cope with it. This will not happen again. In the same way as we stress test banks every year to make sure that they can cope with a crisis that we saw in 08, 09, we're going to see a similar situation happening now where health services are going to be tested. Can we cope with another epidemic or uh, pandemic? Are we in a position that uh, we will not, that we can cope with an increase in, um, in the number of, of, of ill? So expect public health to expand, expect budgets given to public health services to, ex to expand. I think one of the most frightening aspects of this was that um, if people, uh, and this is before lockdown, was a worry that people would hide the disease or hide their infection from, um, you know, uh, uh, from fellow workers. In other words, there were worries that families were too poor or people were too poor to miss a day's work and therefore would go to work with an illness that was contagious or could be spread uh, no more. The Affordable Health Act that Mr. Trump has uh, clamped so hard in a down so hardly um, is not going, sorry, that affordable health will be reintroduced. I think governments will want to ensure that everybody can, um, can afford health. Uh, and that people will not fear losing a day's work uh, wages for fear of, of actually spreading it. 
So I think that's going to be another aspect that governments will look at. Of course, all of these uh, mean more spending. Um, I think also what, what, what another very big, um, very big aspect of it is uh, the pharmaceutical industry. Um, for those of you who follow, and I, we know it from an investment point of view, is that there's been enormous pressure on, on, um, on pharmaceutical companies, on big pharma, to cut down uh, or, or to lower drug prices. Not going to happen anymore. It's been a huge political uh, football. It's been a huge political issue that drug companies are overcharging. And I think what we found now is that we actually need those big drug companies. We need the research and development to continue, which they can't do if they're not getting the kind of margin. Uh, cut down their margin, they will focus on popular diseases. Popular meaning uh, lung cancers or prostate cancers or breast cancers or something like that, rather than looking at a whole other, uh, other forms of, uh, of illnesses or chronic diseases. So you're going to find that more money that, that no one's going to object if research and development increases um, in these particular areas. We need the scientists to look for cures. What are we doing at the moment crying out for a vaccine? Well, without the spin, without the people, without the labs, you're not going to find uh, those vaccines and we need them fast. The other thing is equipment. You know, you can't, in a situation like this, you can't wait five days to have a test, another five days to get the result. And you can't put everybody together, uh, you can't put everybody together uh, in one room to, um, you know, to, to actually test them. It has to be done uh, remotely. So I think from that point of view, it's going to be another area. The equipment manufacturers are going to be in demand. And I think uh, diagnostic machines as well are going to, when I say benefit, are going to prosper from, from this the need to actually be in the position where we can test pretty fastly. I think one of the big winners from what we've seen for the last uh, couple of weeks has been big tech. And one has to congratulate them. And once more, listen to Elizabeth Warren, listen to Mahrit Vestager or something, I can't pronounce her name, and the pressure that they brought on big tech uh, to break them up and not to give them the kind of power. Well, thank goodness they've had this kind of power because, um, uh, thank goodness they've had this kind of power because without those massive platforms, we would not be able to get through what we're going through at the moment. Those are the Amazons, the Netflix, the Facebooks, the Googles, the Apples, those companies that we love to beat up for their power and for their size. But we need them and we need the cash that they've generated. Apple has $100 billion in its bank account. The other tech companies, I don't know, four to 500 billion. At a time where we're handing out cash quite generously, um, I'm sure that, that, that uh, governments need that kind of balance, to, uh, sorry, that kind of cash uh, to back them up. So um, they're coming out the winners. And I think uh, technology has come out as, as, as a massive uh, winner out of this. If we think of our lifestyles at the moment, e-commerce, Amazon, without them, how can you order home? How can you order goods to be delivered? Food deliveries, what about education has taken a big leap upwards. We suddenly realize that we can actually get a lecturer in the UK to lecture our children in South Africa. Um, I think it's going to be huge strides are gonna be made in education. Um, virtual meetings, the fact that we're actually reaching, I don't know what the exact order, audience that we're reaching now, but I've never been to a seminar where I've addressed more than maybe a hundred odd uh, people. The fact that I think we had four or five hundred people sign on, this gives us a whole new range, uh, a whole new range of contract, contacts, um, and, um, you know, that, that we have never had before. And you also read, you also realize that we don't need to travel. You can actually save an enormous expense by, by contacting people like this. So, you know, well done to Zoom, and Zoom shares are probably one of the few few companies that are doing well in this uh, this time. But it applies to Twitter. It applies to all kinds of of social media, whether it's uh, Facebook, whether it's um, Instagram, whatever it is. It has enabled us to keep our lives uh, fairly normal. What about streaming and gaming? 
they're going to prosper. And even when we go back to uh, normal life, I think that things are, are not going to be the same. I think we're going to continue um, to, to go along this path. Um, so the data economy is going to prosper tremendously from this uh, cloud. The fact that we're using so much data means uh, we will continue to use it. The transmission of data, 5G is going to prosper. Uh, I think the, the opportunities in, in, um, in data are just, uh, just un, un, unlimited. Um, going on, I mean, even from there, just, just moving on to that, what, what are we going to monitor? And I think where we're looking at China is to see whether normality is, whether people are beginning to conduct their normal life. Um, LVMH, which is one of my favorite companies, does report that people are coming back to buy luxury. Um, we want to see whether they're going back to Starbucks, whether there is social interaction. I think that's going to be very important to, uh, to monitor. I think I'm going to end it now because I don't want to go on too long and it's not easy just to do a monologue. Um, but I think what is going to become more important now is the hygiene in our lives. It's never been that important. A plane will fly in from Joburg to Durban, uh, people will stream off and uh, people, you know, the cleaners will come in with a vacuum cleaner and probably a plastic bag or a plastic container to collect the rubbish and off, you know, off, uh, off they go and then, then new passengers come on again and off we fly back to Joburg or wherever we go. Not going to happen anymore. From now on, I think in places where people collect, there's going to be a huge amount of uh, changed attitudes towards hygiene. I think most people in, in any public building, the toilets are you know, abominable. And I think there's going to be a lot more, uh, um, a lot more devoted to actually cleaning up toilets and making sure that they're not places where viruses can collect. And I think we're going to be a lot more uh, aware when we do go into public uh, toilets about uh, the, how we leave, you know, the state that we leaving them, that we leave them into. Of course, for companies who service or provide those kind of services, it's going to be a, a boon. But I think we're going to be a lot more aware of, um, you know, of how we conduct our lives. Um, so a lot of changes, uh, you know, expect a lot of changes. I think the other big change, and I'll end off on this note, is that, you know, physicians, virologists. Uh, epidemiologists and all the other names that we've learned recently have hardly enjoyed uh, the kind of celebrity status that we've um, that we've kind of that have been enjoyed by investment banker bankers and hedge fund traders. But I think the way that this virus has jolted our lives is going to change our mindsets and uh, change attitudes for generations. I think the one lesson we have learned is that. Trading strategies, derivative strategies, valuation models can't really heal a community.